everyone who's here now or everyone who watches the recording or if you came in late and you rewind this at one point. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to uh, today's virtual event where we're going to be talking about automated email and MS, SMS mastery. So we've got retain and rain. We're going to be talking about automated emails, everything. We're going to go from the very, very beginning concept of, of automating your emails all the way to the end. So we're going to start off with the technical stuff, which I know is um, actually I lied. I think we left the technical stuff for a little bit later because I knew everyone was going to want to know about it. Yep. So we are going to talk about the technical stuff. We're going to do that later. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, automated emails to consider that you should be setting up, how to set them up. We've even got, if you're a Klaviyo user, we've got screenshots and everything to show you exactly how to set them up. Um, and then we're going to get into how to structure them, how to A-B test them, how to optimize them as time goes on. Because automated emails, while they are uh, awesome, because once you set them up, it's kind of, you know, uh, set it and forget it sort of thing. It's not really supposed to be. It's supposed to be continuous improvements, adjustments over time, so that you're constantly retaining and reigning. You like how I did that? I did. <laughs> uh, all right. Who are we? Ladies first. Thank you. I'm Hannah. Um, I am the content marketing manager here at Blue Tusker. So I oversee all things content, but also specifically email as well. So that is my role. Beautiful. Uh, Andrew Mapp, I'm the founder and CEO here at Blue Tusker. And I uh, know much less than Hannah does, which is why Hannah's doing this with me. So today, super fun. We, we like making these inter interesting and entertaining because I don't know if you've attended virtual like events like this before in the past, uh, but they can be very boring. So we're going to try and entertain them, liven it up a little bit. Maybe you're hanging out, eating lunch. Uh, and that's, that's going to be our goal here is to just give you an hour of fun, learning, and entertainment. We're going to go through uh, the technical deliverability aspects, which I know a lot of people are going to have questions about specific to uh, a week from now, Google and Yahoo's changes. Um, we'll talk about all the top flows that you should like definitely have in place. We'll even get into like some of the smaller ones that you should consider, uh, how to maintain them, how to optimize them, how to grow your list. This is everything from an automation standpoint, from an email uh, and SMS perspective, the only thing that we won't be talking about is kind of your, your campaigns and, you know, whether you're sending one-offs every now and then or if you're doing them frequently. We're sticking to 100% automation today. Housekeeping. There's a chat. Feel free to use it. Ask us anything you want. We are more than happy to ask, answer questions throughout the entire event today uh, or even towards the end if you want to do that then. Or obviously, you can also shoot us an email and we will help out then but feel free to put in any questions, comments, concerns that you might have in here. And then of course, at the very end, we have to make sure that this was valuable and worth your time. So we're going to be sending everyone our awesome 19, it's, it's specific to Klaviyo, but it is very justifiable for almost every other platform. Um, it's just the screenshots will probably look a little bit different because obviously everyone's UX is different, but it's the 19 Klaviyo automated email and SMS flows why you need them and how to set them up. So you've got all the screenshots and a walkthrough of everything. So it's like an SOP of setting them up. And the wonderful, amazing Hannah who has joined me today is the one who facilitated that whole thing. So you know that it is flawless. And we're gonna give away an email marketing audit towards the end as well. Someone's going to, we're gonna give them away just cause we can. Why you're here. Good chance you're looking to obviously increase ROI, who isn't, and you're also looking to retain your customers, and you're probably really tired of increasing customer acquisition costs. If you're deep in paid advertising, you know that CPMs and CPCs go up every couple seconds. So getting new customers is getting more and more expensive. Retaining them is the hardest part. Once you spend all of that money getting your first customer, it's usually a lot easier to get them to come back and shop a second time, but that is typically provided that you have things like this set up. So we're gonna be discussing how to do that. Uh, and we're gonna show you exactly how all the brands that we work with, how we set them up. Seven, eight figure brands, some of them with subscribers and hundreds of thousands and it gets insane. So we're gonna go through the whole thing, show you exactly what we do and then you can do it yourself or obviously why we do these, you reach out to us. Uh, so you got a bunch of new contacts. I love the way we timed this up uh, because this is obviously post Q4, right? So Q4, 
everyone spends an arm and a leg getting new customers and then they just go cold for and in forever. And so this, this whole concept of being able to automate them and keep them coming back in 2024, I see Q4 as, you know, it's for a lot of brands, it's when they make their most money, but I also see it as this is your time to get as many new customers as possible so that next year you're in a better position. Um, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna touch on all this stuff about how to keep them coming back, how to keep them interested in your email marketing, all that kind of stuff. First thing I want to do though, we're gonna do a poll because I'm genuinely curious. Uh, where'd we go? There we go. What percent of your revenue is currently driven from email and or SMS marketing? Let us know, just because we can kind of adjust conversation and things like that through here. I'll leave this up for a little bit, um, but it's always a very interesting thing. I've seen people where it's couple percentage points if that i've seen others where it's like geez hannah we had someone i think it was like 50 something percent of their revenue yeah their google analytics mm -hmm. nuts paul's running yeah all the time answer if you want um of course we're going to talk about like who are we why are we talking about this what exactly do we know we're not just making a lot of this stuff up um, we've worked with, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of different D 2 C brands, B2B brands, um, that are specific to the e-commerce side. We are Clavio partners. We've worked with some awesome brands. Obviously there's some, you know, glorified examples. Uh, you know, this one with this brand we worked with MD glam saw a real nice 275% improvement in email revenue. And that was in less than I think it was, well, it was a little over three so a little less than four months we'll say um and then we had someone lifelong collectibles did almost the exact same thing that one was definitely less than three months that was a real nice turnaround mm -hmm. um so we know what we're talking about we've got the proof behind everything we're going to show you everything that we've got going on um karen less than 10 percent. you want it to be more hopefully this webinar helps oh man i didn't hit publish you know that would explain why no one answered the poll and you guys are typing it in there. We're off to a good start, Hannah. We are. That's okay. It happens. <laughs> I'm not going to have some forties though. I'm not going to judge you for it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Not again. Um, all right. So there, some of the people that already answered it. So, wow. All right. So we've got, uh, a good chunk of you, 26 to 50%, which is great. You have some people on the 10%. Awesome. So here's the thing I will caveat with. It also kind of depends on how you're judging where that revenue is coming from and what attribution you're looking at, right? If you look in your Google Analytics, which is traditionally last click, that's going to show you everyone that clicked on an email and then made a purchase like right away. But if you're looking at it within uh, Clavio or MailChimp or Active Campaign or whatever it is you're using, they have an attribution model. If they got an email and then purchased, they're going to take credit for it. So if you look in Clavio, there's been times where like we'll look in Clavio, it will take credit for more sales than actually came in because of the the giant attribution window sometimes. So grain of salt, but looks like most people are 50% or less, but a good 50% of you have it between 26 and 50%, which is not too shabby at all. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. All right, Hannah, ready to do this? Oh, let's do it. We did the intro, we did all the fun stuff. As we said, if you got questions, comments, concerns, you think I'm talking too much, you guys just put it in the chat, Hannah, you can just say it. Um, well, we're gonna talk about optimizing your list first get into the basic stuff. We'll try to fly through some of the basics. There's a handful of things we're going to be like, thank you, Andrew and Hannah. Yeah, we know. We're going to skim through a lot of this stuff. Um, your basic stuff, your pop-ups, your newsletter signups, skated content, anything you're doing cross-channel, like if you're doing uh, Facebook ad lead forms or anything like that, ton of different ways to grow your email list. Uh, there's a, a very common theme that I always like to say, which is uh, emails are your second most important KPI, right? Profitability and or revenue, depending on your brand, are usually number one. Your email list is pretty much number two because, yes, that should theoretically be turning into revenue and improving your ROI, but it is also a massive asset. So when you do go to exit one day, having a really nice size email list, 
usually works out pretty well. No one gets mad at it. There's a bunch of interesting ways to do this stuff too, right? So you have birthday, anniversary pop-ups, um, multi-step different forms you can do. Sales and campaigns are pretty standard. The birthdays and anniversaries are incredibly underused in my opinion. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. Like it, a lot of them now, like you'll see a pop-up and uh, most of the time, what they ask for an email and a phone number. So they get SMS. But if you can get like, when's your birthday, when's your, you know, if you're a, a wedding brand or uh, something that's specific to like a, um, like a gifting brand for couples, like having that anniversary. So you can like send them a little discount right before the anniversary, make sure they come back to you. Love. I got several brands that hit me up right before my anniversary. It drives me crazy because it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's great to just build that trust and rapport with the contacts that you have by learning more about them. I mean, just having that, it almost kind of feels like that communication, even though it's not. But when you have that communication, it really solidifies that relationship between brand and consumer. It goes yeah. a long way. Plus the personalization of it. Mm -hmm. Most Pretty likely. nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got another poll. It's the last poll, though. I know it kind of feels like I did a lot of polls, but I want to make sure that we kind of are able to get a judgment of where we need to take a lot of this conversation but very interested in how many different automated email and or SMS flows you have that are set up right now. Um, just so we can get a general understanding. Most people tend to be, uh, wow, someone's got over 31 of them. That's a good amount of flows. So well done. Seeing some of the typical though. So yeah, a little less than 10 tends to be a, a more frequent. Uh, we're going to show you how to get to whoever's got the 30 plus there. Um, yeah, so I'll let that sit for a minute. Best practices. So the non-negotiable automated email flows. This is my favorite because the way you worded this is like, you're doing it. I'm not having this conversation with you. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta just be direct. <laughs> Would you like to take this one, Hannah? Sure. Yeah, so welcome series. Um, everyone should probably have a welcome series. That is a non-negotiable. It's the best way um, to solidify who you are, especially when someone comes from a former pop-up and they, you know, put in their email. Um, our best practice is typically having it separated out from someone. So let's just say if they come to your website purchase and then you have like a little checkbox or something um, that then subscribes them to um, your newsletter or things like that. Typically we like to diversify purchasers from non-purchasers just then that way we can kind of target our messaging a little bit more specifically to, you know, we still want to obviously share the branding and all of that stuff as well. But obviously if someone has not made a purchase on your website yet, but they're just curious, we want to, we want to position the messaging a little bit differently to them versus someone that obviously has already given your product a try are, you know, consistent shoppers and then just want to maintain with your brand. So welcome series. It's typically over a 10 day period, um, two to three days in between. Um, but the content is obviously going to be, we recommend diversified between purchasers and non-purchasers. Beautiful. I love with welcome series it, it, as like a introduction to the brand and an introduction to the brand's email marketing. Here's what you're going to expect in your inbox over time. Or if it's a welcome series SMS, here's how often we're going to text you so that I can have a heads up. If you're one of those brands, God forbid, that sends a text message like every day or every week, like chill. I want to know that ahead of time because I might unsubscribe because it drives me crazy. But like, is it going to be entertaining? Is it going to be fun? Am I only on, on the lookout for promotions? Like giving people a little bit of insight into what's coming with the brand. And then from the thank you side, this being more aligned with when you've worked so hard to get that first purchase, like that first customer, even if you have thousands and thousands of orders a day, you still work really hard to get each of those individually, especially for your net new customers, sending them some kind of personalized thank you around that. We did, the example here uh, was the direction that this client we were working with wanted to go in. I also really like doing, um, depending on your brand and the direction you want it to go in, like a, uh, almost like a letter from the founder, like, hey, you know, like you can even make it look like a letter, like, having it just kind of give a little bit more of a personal touch, some of the inside of their story, or even if you don't do it from the founder, you can do, done it with people who are like, they're the head of customer service and things like that. Like just something to give 
a little bit of love behind the brand and really thank them for coming to shop with you. Um, the obvious being your abandoned cart, right? This is another, like, clearly this is a non-negotiable. If you don't have an abandoned cart flow, please come on. There's also things you can think about through all of these, right? Like we talked about, Hannah mentioned welcome series, if they've purchased or if they haven't. Thank you series. You could actually look at having countless flows for this if you set it up as a specialized type of thank you for an individual type of product. Within Klaviyo or within MailChimp or whatever you're using, you can use segmentation, personalization. You can actually have it set where maybe you've just got one flow and it changes out depending on what they're tagged as. Or if you want to get a, a little bit wider with it, you can have it automate based, based on them getting a certain type of thank you depending on what they purchased, whether it's a specific product or a specific collection page. Same thing with the abandoned cart series, right? You might have a product where it's like, I don't want to offer them a discount on the second or third abandoned cart, but for some of the other ones, yeah, I'll give up 10% if I can get them to come back. So then you can actually look at splitting up your abandoned cart series by profit margin, revenue, however you want to do that, depending again, depending on your brand so that you're convincing someone to come back and to check out, but then possibly not losing too much cash. Right. Plus the other side of it also being like, I usually don't like on the first abandoned cart email offering a sale. Sometimes I just forget to close stuff. So like, give me a while. Like patience is a virtue. Then if you're like, oh, let me get you 10% off for coming back. Okay. Then they come back. Right. Am I missing anything on that? Nope. You're dead on. <laughs> Thanks. Should I take this one, ma'am? So uh, Sunset is really good for list cleaning. So especially um, with all of the new updates, which we will get into, this kind of helps do some of the work for you in a sense where a lot of non-engaged contacts or things like that, people that have not purchased for you in a long period of time, people that have um, not engaged with any of your content, those types of things really help to solidify people that want to be engaged with your contact or within your content and people that don't want to be engaged. You're not losing anything by, um, you know, sending to people that genuinely are not interested. Like you, or maybe I reverse that. <laughs> like you don't want to send to people that genuinely are not engaged in your content. So you're not losing anything by losing those contacts. So Sunset Series is kind of, I like to say that like, I like to frame it more as like a Hail Mary. It's like, okay, here's one last attempt to get you to stay on our list. And then from there, if you really don't want to stay, we will just weed you out ourselves. Some people like to do offers in here, um, especially if the main goal is purchasing. Other people, I've seen some really nice emails where they pretty much do some more humor based of like, if we're, if we're going to break up, we're going to break up. So just let us know if you want us to stay. And then if not, we will just unsubscribe you from our email list themselves. So it kind of helps to just control the amount of subscribers in your in your list that genuinely are just no longer interested with your content. Yeah. Clavio doesn't really give an option to automatically unsubscribe someone. Um, but what we usually suggest doing is like, because everything on our end is very process driven, we'll set it up where there's a automated flow that goes into a sunset series based on certain parameters. You know, they haven't even opened an email in a year or something like that. We try to email them a couple more times. And then if it doesn't go through, they immediately get put into a segmented list. Then on like a monthly or a quarterly basis, that list gets reviewed and then it gets exported and then uploaded into like a Google drive or something. So you don't lose the emails because if you if they were a purchaser at one point, right, you could take that list, put it into Facebook ads and actually just try to get them like run ads to them, try to get them to come back that way. But keep your costs down, right? Like Clavio is going to charge you an arm and a leg by keeping all those people just sitting in there. So you can go through, actually just get rid of them, unsubscribe them, suppress them, whatever you got to do. Keeps your Clavio cost down. Same thing with every other platform out there. And so that way you attempted to get them back, but you can save um, some of the money on your software costs. Mm -hmm. It's not too different from your winback series. So you could, in theory, have a customer winback series that then also over time pivots into a sunset series. The difference being 
that and usually why I don't suggest doing that is because your sunset series, you want to sunset people that aren't opening emails. They're not clicking them. They haven't been to your website. They've done nothing. They are arguably useless to you after a while. They're gone. Win back series, you could have people that open up emails, click emails, go to your website, all this fun stuff for a long time, but just haven't purchased with you in a while. You don't want to get rid of them. Maybe the time's just not right. You don't want to annoy them. We're in marketing, not in sales. Let them, they'll come when they're ready kind of thing. So a win back series, I, I always think should be separate. And it very much is like a, hey, don't forget about us, right? Like where you been, that kind of stuff. I also think that there's a lot of A-B testing that can go on here because if you're sending a ton of emails with, let's say, um, uh, short quips and like emojis all the time. And those are your campaigns and they're engaging with them and they kind of look at them and fine. It is what it is, but they haven't converted. Maybe you want one that really stands out. So maybe you do like a slightly longer subject line with no, no emojis for this, like something to get them to engage a little bit differently outside of what they might be used to so that this email stands out more. And then again, with this one, depending on your uh, your other automated emails, your other campaigns, if they're very, very product heavy of like, hey, buy this, buy that, here's our best sellers, that kind of thing. Maybe you don't want this to be too overly salesy or maybe you do. Maybe it's like a, hey, we haven't, you haven't shopped with us in a while. Check out all this stuff that is our top sellers right now that people seem to love. I still suggest that first one, the first customer win back, doesn't necessarily have to have a discount in it. I don't like to just give up cash right away. I'd rather like, try to get them to come back. And then if not, then consider it. So maybe you send one, wait a week or two, send another one, and then look at, you know, if you want to offer a discount or something. And that timing is also very dependent on your own sales cycle, right? You might have a product line where someone comes in and they're like, ah, I think I want this, but it takes them a little while because it's not the cheapest thing. And, and you know, they want to feel it out, make sure that they want to make that decision. Others, it's like they're going to buy it in two seconds. You might as well send another one a couple of days later. So there's stuff like that as well, where for each brand, timing of some of these is also very important. Um, Tradesies, you want to take this one? Best customer, um, reward your VIPs. That's probably the, the easiest way to sum this one up. So the people, and this is going to be um, dependent on whatever you value most for some, it's if they've purchased X amount of times for others, it's going to be, well, if they've spent X amount of dollars, you could, you know, test out both in terms of like segmentations and things like that. But overall, best thing to do is if you have um, consumers or contacts that are very loyal to you, they are continuously purchasing, um, they are very highly engaged, you don't really have to do a lot to, I guess, you know, keep them interested in your in your brand, it's always best to reward them. Um, you can do so in terms of like loyalty programs. Um, so if your business has loyalty programs set up, you can do so by, you know, giving them additional points or, you know, however that maps out. You can also do so with um, free gifts, exclusive gifts. Um, you just always want to reward those that pour into your business. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much the gist of that one. Love it. <laughs> then there's like 500 other ones, right? So we like, those are the basic ones. Those were, uh, as Hannah coined perfectly, the non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. Then you factor in so many other things, right? So what we've got listed, which we talked about on the pop-ups, your birthday flow, your anniversary flow, uh, basic stuff, right? Then you can look at like application flows, so if you're a B2B commerce seller, this makes a lot of sense. Um, or the other side of it being, if you have a really complicated product, it might actually be really beneficial to have a flow that goes out that's like, hey, don't forget that you could use that you could use it like this. Or every now and then you might want to clean it like this or something like that. Then you've got a maintenance flow, which was one of the ones I was thinking about in here that I didn't add. Like um, we work with a, a bunch of different clients on a on a b2b commerce side that have these massive machines and stuff that they sell and they really should clean them after every use or clean them every month or so in which case then you can put in basically having like hey you purchased this a month ago if you've been using it you should clean it now like basically just maintenance sides and be like oh if you ever have this break 
here's our, you know, tools and accessories, et cetera. Uh, Denise asked about, asked about the application flow. So application could really be like, really, we, we looked at this for two different ways. From a B2B perspective, it depends on how you use the word application, but it could also be a someone has applied for a wholesale account, and then you want to have an application flow that way. You could use it as a literally they're using it to how do they apply the product to certain things. And so that's a different perspective. Like I just mentioned the machines and stuff. The One of the uh, sellers we work with, there's 10 different ways that you could use the machine. So what is the different application in place? Then you could also have like someone applied to be uh, in a VIP group that you created. So kind of depends on how you want to use the word application there. Cause now I'm kind of realizing like it actually works on a DTC perspective too. Yeah. Um, price drops are big. If you can set up, if you've got a good CRO team and they're setting up different aspects on your site where people can be like, Oh, alert me if this price comes down and you have a, a website where you're, um, uh, you know, you're doing drops every now and then, or you're deciding like, oh, we're going to put this stuff on sale. That's great. Back in stock is very self-explanatory. If you've got stuff that you're running out of stock on pretty frequently, clavio has got a nice little walkthrough of exactly how to do that. The transactional stuff is very straightforward. The transactional stuff actually always shocks me that like, typically like I actually prefer to have them just come straight out of Shopify because I can, it's kind of easier Mm -hmm. But you've got Clavio's templates that you can use so that you can like customize them, make them look nice, add some fun to it. Like it's, uh, Shopify's got their um, standard like, uh, you know, shipping confirmation, uh, order confirmation, shipment delivered, shipment like out for delivery kind of thing. And they're very boring. Like it's just like, yeah, you take some colors, but then like that's it. So like give them some love, like zhuzh them up a little bit. <laughs> um, browser abandonment. Not a lot of people think of this one. If they add to cart and they leave, cart abandonment. Oh, I want you to do that. But if you've already got their email, you can trigger something if they come to your website and don't take an action. So let's try to get them to add something to cart. Hey, I saw you were checking this out. Are there any questions I can answer for you? You could actually have your, you could have the reply to email be a customer service email so that if they've got questions, you can help out that way. Pop-up discount confirmation flow. A lot of people will have a pop-up on their website, the most standard thing of all time, 10% off your first order, right? Most people will trigger the welcome series when that happens. And they will say like, oh, here's your discount, blah, blah. But then the problem is if, if you've got, let's say a newsletter sign up in your footer or something like that, they didn't ask for a discount. So don't give it to them. If they didn't ask for one, don't give it to them because I don't think that you should just be willy-nilly throwing percentages off all the time. So there should be a delineation of that. Plus, if you decide like, I wanna change my pop-up and change the discount on it, you can adjust that. Or if you use your pop-ups for uh, personalization, they visited one page, you wanna give them X percent off. Maybe they visited a different category, you wanna give them a different percentage off. You need to have different flows to be able to respond to what is that discount that you're providing. Um, bounce back flow. This one's really cool for like, I've seen this do really well with like apparel brands and things like that. So that would be someone just made a purchase and within 24 hours, usually you send them a pretty decent discount to come back and buy again, ideally add to their existing order. So it's basically like an upsell, but it's like a, Hey, you just purchased from us as a thank you. Come back now and add this or use this really large discount in the next 48 hours kind of thing. You'd be surprised at how many people are like, nah, I did want to get that other thing. Yeah, I'll get it. Upsell, cross-sell, very self-explanatory. You can do that in six different ways for however many products you want to do. Replenishment stuff for anyone who's got consumables. Uh, so food, obviously. Um, uh, geez, I've done a lot of work with like um, air filters and water filters and that kind of stuff. So like, hey, every quarter you just send them a reminder if they're not a subscriber. Product review requests, very self-explanatory as well. Um, th I mean, this the the list theoretically doesn't end because A, you could segment it by product or by collection. You could segment it by uh, profile, uh, so like customer type. Um, there was something else I was thinking of. 
And two, like if you wanted to do on your, you know, if you have like, let's just say a quiz on your website or things like that, and then you can really understand their interests, you can then segment by their interests. So uh, me personally, skincare brand. So if, you know, I have a certain skin type or whatever, then they will put me in a flow that's very specific to products that are based off of the quiz that I submitted. So that way I only get fed products that are in correlation with my skincare you know, test results essentially. So can be very personalized to interests as well. Yeah, and uh, to that point, any gated content would work, right? So like you think about a lot of times people think of the basic flows, which a lot, we went through the, the non-negotiables. Some of these are a little bit outside of what we typically find when we first get into account. But what you really got to think about when you're thinking about automated flows is as soon as a customer or a contact does anything on your website, they could click on a certain button, they could visit a certain page, they could uh, be on a page for a certain amount of time, they could visit X amount of pages, they could go to a blog, they could go to a product, like any of that could trigger anything you want. It could trigger an email, it could trigger an SMS, it could trigger a sales focused email, it could trigger a customer service focused email. So there's so many different things to think about when it's going through and really what the what becomes the the really big challenging part when you're looking at automations and and how many you want to set up and i want to you know ping my customers all the time the other thing you got to think about is you really need to understand the flows that you put in place because if you do let's think of let's say you get really crazy with this and you're like all right if they click on this button on my home page I want to send them an email. If they visit three pages, I want to send them an email because they show interest. If they visit a blog, they may not have intent, so I want to send them back to my site. If they add something to cart, I want to do an abandoned cart. You could theoretically end up emailing someone four to five times in a single day. So you've got to look at the automations you have in place. Why are they set up? What is the goal? And is it possible for someone to get triggered through a bunch of those? Now, Clavio does have Smart Send. Um, so you can set it where it's like, okay, I'm not going to bother emailing someone if they don't do something, but then you got to think about which one do you prefer because they might not get the one you preferred first. So sometimes that smart send thing can kind of get in the way. So there's a finessing to it of like, who's getting what and how often am I sending people emails? Free gift. I'm gonna send this over to you guys. Uh, so this was all the stuff, uh, a lot of the stuff we talked about, what we did is we actually went through and we took screenshots of all the flows in Clavio and how to set them up. Um, there's examples in there outside of the ones we had in this deck around like emails that did really well for us that you know were structured a certain way, CTAs in certain spots, things like that. Uh, SMS flows are in there. Um, there's even how-to information on like how to set it up and things like that. Uh, it's totally free. I'm going to send it to you guys once we're all said and done here. Um, I will, it'll probably be in your inbox within the hour after the uh, event here is all set. So that's going to come by your way so that you guys have some insight into the flow side of things. Now we're going to talk about the too much communication side, which I kind of just touched on. So I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, since I kind of already <laughs> touched on it, would you like to take that over, ma'am? Yeah. So um, this kind of applies to both your newsletters, campaigns, and then also automations as well. As Andrew mentioned, you do have to be a little bit more strategic. It is an art when it comes to how much communication you are sending. Typically from a newsletter side of things, you, depending on the size of your list and depending on also the engagement, the type of content that you're sending, that's all going to be very specific to you and your brand but it is best to at least try to aim for at least one email a week if you are slightly smaller in list size um, larger brands can get away with sometimes you know three emails a week maybe more um, but again that's going to be very specific to campaigns and newsletters you also have to keep in mind the automation side of it as well so chances are if they're subscribed they are somewhere in your flows as well so smart sending as andrew mentioned is something that you can manipulate both in automations and in campaign sending. So if you're sending out a newsletter and you think it's very niche, it's very specific, you're sending to a certain segment or group of segments, you can turn that smart sending on. So if they would have received that automation 
within 16 hours, they will be skipped for that campaign. You can do the same thing as mentioned with the automation side of things. But again, to Andrew's point, you just wanna be very specific as to what you would be okay with a contact skipping over and what you wouldn't. Um, in terms of too much communication, it is a thing. So think about um, you know people that you have sending you emails, sending you SMSs, there is such thing as overkill. So you don't want to damage your reputation in terms of how much communication you are sending to your contacts, but you also don't wanna be ghost either and only contact them you know, once a month, like once every couple of months or things like that, because that can also be very damaging and take a warm, what would be a warm audience into a cold audience, which would then obviously create a little bit more larger issues down the road. So it is a balancing act, but, the good thing with Clavio, as Andrew mentioned, is it is manipul like you can manipulate it um, for both automations and campaigns. You can test it out. You can see how much it would be um, excluded if you do toggle it on. And then, as always, just assess your results, your analytics, and then you can always course correct from there. Love it. Secondary goals and stuff. I know we talked about some of this stuff already, but like not every email needs to be a sales pitch. Mm -hmm. It's you want to keep your email warm so that people have interest. Sometimes we've even done email, even we, we even do them for ourselves where we'll do emails where we actually don't need you to go anywhere. We, we might give you, we're going to give you the opportunity, but it's not like a, Hey, buy this or Hey, check out this new product and go to this page. Like everyone is always so entrenched on getting the sale, getting the sale, getting the sale. And sometimes you've got to remember that email marketing specifically is very much a media outlet. And sometimes just providing them news or providing them some kind of entertainment, like you're building a community, you're building a, a list of engaged people. And sometimes that might not mean trying to get a purchase out of them every single time. If you hung out with a friend and all they ever wanted you to do was, oh man, what's that? Um, buy Tupperware from you. I forgot that name of that company. But if they're constantly like, man, if you, you want to see my Tupperware, like it would be obnoxious and you would be like, I don't want to hang out with that guy anymore. So it's the same concept of like, have a chat with the people on your list every now and then have like a monthly, like, ah, oh, here's like a super fun thing that we do on Fridays. We've got some clients um, on a B2B side where we're not asking for a sale. We're showcasing one of the clients that they work with and product that they bought from them. We've done uh, countless brands that we do weekly recipes with. And yeah, you can go and buy the product that we reference in the recipe. But really the goal is try this recipe this weekend and give it a shot. So don't always make your emails buy this, buy this, buy this, because that's what that's what happened to direct mail, right? It was just flyers of crap. It's like, here's a discount, here's a discount, here's a magazine with a ton of catalog crap in it. No, change it up to like, oh, if someone hand wrote me a letter of just wanting to say hi, I'm gonna read that before I read your as seen on TV looking flyer that you stuck in my mailbox. It's the same concept from email marketing. Like, let's, let's tone it back a little bit every now and then. Doesn't have to be all the time, but like, let's ease it up and marketing is about bringing people together, uh, building a community around a brand, and then being in the right place at the right time. Your automations are gonna do a lot of the selling for you because you wanna be in the right place at the right time, but otherwise it's just about engaging so that when you do trigger an email from them, they actually open it and look at it. A-B testing stuff. Dear God, no one A-B tests enough. It blows my mind, especially with like automations, this is like, it's one of these things that like really drives me up a wall. Cause you like get in there and you're like, really, you set this up two years ago and you're like, I don't know why it's not working anymore. You've got to AB test everything you possibly can. Subject lines, CTA placements. Think about um, when you do uh, like CRO stuff, right? AB testing uh, button colors, not really going to do much for you unless you're on Apple maybe, but like otherwise not a big deal. But then think about like subject lines. Do they like them long and, and uh, 
like super detailed, short with an emoji? Do they want, is your snippet uh, kind of catchy or is it just like a, here's what you're about to see when you open this? Do they want to see uh, this picture? Do they want to see that picture? Um, is a, a complete white background versus a complete back, black background going to help? Because some people are on dark mode and sometimes that gets messed up. So there's so many different aspects that you should be A-B testing. From an automation standpoint, the nice thing is you set up the automations, you set up A-B tests for everything, and then you just kind of like let it coast for a little while. Go check on your A-B tests, see what the results are, push one of them live, set up some new A-B tests, let them coast for a little while. So it's something you can do on a quarterly basis. For a campaign perspective, even when you're doing those, I know it's a little bit outside of what we were talking about, subject lines, snippets, creative, uh, copy that you're using, um, is it really salesy? Is it not really salesy? Is there a certain image using? Is there not a certain image like day, time of day, day of the week? There's so many things to A-B test to figure out what is going to get you the best numbers. And just like through uh, when you're doing like CRO stuff, it, it's just those incremental improvements over time. Like if you A-B test your subject line until the cows, cows come home, eventually you're going to figure out what your audience is most interested in and it's going to improve your open rate. Now you've got them in the email. Now they're opening up your emails. Now you're getting uh, like the one we had here, 60, 70% uh, people opening it up. Okay, cool. Now how do I get them to do what I want them to do within the email? Let's A-B test copy. Let's A-B test colors, image replacement, that kind of stuff. Tone of voice. I missed that one. That's a big one. Super salesy. It's more friendly. Very big difference. Mm -hmm. um, you want to take this one? Yeah. So from here, it's really just about um, basically taking, so you've, you've solidified your test and now it all comes down to duration and pretty much taking the insights that you found and constantly testing against that. So in the case of subject lines, as Andrew, um, for Andrew's example here, you know, run it for a month, try more long-winded, short-winded. You you come to find out that, you know, short, punchier with an emoji seems to work better with your audience. Great. But don't just run with that and never test that again. You uh, like you're constantly getting more and more people funneling in. People are subscribing every day. They're dropping into flows. They're dropping into all these things. And just like your brand is constantly evolving, so are the interests, so is the market, everything. So you always want to take your top performer and just test against that. And then if consistently over, you know, six to eight months, it still seems to be the leading one, great. You know, and that's not to say too that you just run one test consistently. You can constantly test other things. So while you are having, you know, your subject line testing, you know, track that from an open rate perspective. And then when you're looking at your click rate, your click through rate, your attributed revenue, whatever those goals are from inside your email, then you can really see too, okay, I'm getting the people in, but now I also want to see how they are um, engaging. Like, are they clicking the CTAs that I want? You know, you can even test where the CTA is within an email, you know, below or above, things like that. And so you really just want to, um, continuously test and there's no stopping point for A-B testing. Even if you have a clear and concise winner, things can always change, they can always evolve. So you just always wanna be in that mindset that nothing is solidified ever in email marketing or marketing in general. Yeah. And the tracking your progress thing is, is so key mm -hmm. there, right? So you, we noted on here, track your progress, uh, chart optimization, testing recognized pattern. like. Of the brands we've worked with where they're like, oh, yeah, we do A-B testing. It's always like, oh, great. Can you send us the report on, you know, the A-B test that you've run? They're like, oh, yeah, it's just like it's in the platform. Like, no, 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 no. You've got to have basically like a testing calendar. So like for us, we've got a spreadsheet with, uh, you know, okay, here's the date the email's going out and uh, nuances around the theme and all that fun stuff. But then it's, okay, here's what we're testing this for this email it's it, everything gets tested at some point so all right so for this email we're testing subject line here's what was tested here's what the winning variation was here's what that subject line was then all right they are now we're testing um uh geez creative right so uh we're testing this type of image versus that type of image here's the variation that won here's uh the actual image that won so then you can filter that spreadsheet by here's every subject line test i've ever done 
here's what the winners are. What's the theme here? Do they have emojis? Do they not have emojis? And then all of a sudden you're like, all right, when I go to create an email, I already know what I'm kind of headed towards to start A-B testing. You do usually what we map out is like, all right, for the first, you know, quarter, we're going to map out, we're, or maybe not the first quarter, the first like month or two, we're going to do subject line tests. Then we're going to do snippet tests. Then we're going to do CTA tests. Then we're going to do imagery tests. Then we're going to do tone of voice tests. And we're going to go back to subject line tests. Then we're going to do snippet tests. Like it, it's always adjusting and tweaking as time goes on. Your testing will never end. It's the same thing with optimizing them live, uh, especially for automations. It's the most commonly untested thing that we ever see. Um, you know, if you're switching them from live to manual, it's obviously going to pause anything that's going on. So sometimes you might want to do that, depending on what you're A-B testing. Sometimes you won't. Um, reviewing Klaviyo's benchmarks are really great. Um, but really, this, this kind of comes still together with the previous slide. And it's just a matter of, like, make sure that you're A-B testing your automations just as frequently as you're testing your campaigns. Something that you could do as well, depending on, you know, if this is something you're doing internally and it's a bandwidth thing, A-B test your campaigns because it's the easiest thing that you can do. You can get a good chunk of data faster, figure out which subject lines are working the best, and then go load that type of subject line into your automations. And then if you want, A-B test them there too and let it sit for a little while. So at least you've got some data behind the concept that you're going to test with. Additional email functionalities and stuff. Um, really this kind of still stems back to other aspects, right? Like, yes, we're trying to get people convert. Yes. We're trying to um, build a community and engage people, but there's also a lot of other benefits of email marketing that a lot of people don't think about your email marketing improves your SEO. No one thinks about that, but if you actually improve your deliverability, you get more people to open up your email, you get more people to click your email, you get more people to visit your website. The more people that visit your website, specifically certain pages, gives gives Google that much more data on certain pages, that page authority goes up, it ranks better, all of a sudden your SEO, you start seeing improvement. If you do a lot of paid advertising, you know, if you increase your budget by a good amount, you're going to see your organic traffic go up. But if you decrease your budget by a good amount, you're going to see your organic traffic come down. And that's just because of the amount of triggers that Google's using when you send people to the site. So there's a lot of other things around there. It could also just be educational, building thought leadership, become like the place that, you know, tells people about whatever your industry is and become like almost like a little tiny pseudo media outlet to provide that kind of information. Oh, this is all you. <laughs> um, so obviously when it comes to the content side of things, specifically copy, tone of voice, things like that. AI, it's, I mean, it's everywhere, but it really is a very helpful tool to use, especially if they're, if you're having like creative block, if you don't, you know, have a lot of creative people on your team, things like that. This is a great crutch to even at least just provide you with inspiration in terms of how to um, leverage your content, how to, you know, especially with like the testing side of things, trying out different tones of voices. Um, this is a really great tool, again, either to use as a crutch or, you know, if it's something where chat GPT just hits it right off the gate, then we can obviously, you know, use that as well. Um, but one thing to note, obviously, just because I have to plug it for artificial intelligence, it does not know your brand like you do. It does not know your customers like you do. It pulls off of, you know, generalized resources and things that are currently floating around, obviously from its data um, source, but only you know the intricacies of your business. So definitely use these tools as crutches, as inspiration ideas, as things to tools to help because they genuinely do help, but don't just blindly follow it just because again, only you will know your customer, the intricacies of your business and everything in between the best, so. Wouldn't be a marketing event without talking about AI. <laughs> Naturally. All right, let's talk about it. So if, uh, if you are a Klaviyo user, you probably got an email this morning uh, that was talk about like great timing on the day we did the event. So we're exactly a week away from Google and Yahoo's changes. Um, a lot of people are really afraid of the iOS change. A lot of people are really afraid of the Google Analytics GA4 change. 
Uh, I wouldn't panic about this one, but definitely still something that you want to change because if you don't really what everyone worries about is like, Oh, if I don't do it, my business is going to shut down. You're not. But if you don't, basically what happens is you're going to end up in a spam folder for a while. And then it's going to take some time for you to get it back. And you're going to have to address this at a certain point to get out of it. So the key is to get out, get into this now. So what they put in is, is basically new deliverability requirements, right? So this is starting February, 2024. Um, they didn't solidify a date, but I've seen some areas where it's literally like on the first. So it's supposed to be next week. According to Clavio's email this morning, that seemed accurate. So we'll see what happens. Um, it's for people that are sending more than 5,000 emails a day. That sounds like a lot. It's really not. Especially if you factor in your automations, if you really start to ramp up your automations, uh, let's say you start doing browser abandonments, you start doing um, new customer, best customer, all the thank yous, all the fun stuff that we talked about today, you're going to be triggering a pretty good amount of emails and to hit 5k in a day, really not that complicated. So you're going to get up there. And even if you don't and you're not there now, you will one day. So you want to make sure you get ahead of that. So there's the, a really big technical aspect of email marketing that a lot of people overlook. That is your DMARC, your DKIM, and your SPF, which is basically certain, the best way to explain it in layman's terms is it's basically like a bunch of types of different types of code that you put into your DNS. So that is where your domain is hosted. And it's a way for Google to verify that you are in fact the owner that you uh, have a safe like domain based on the codes and stuff that are put in there and it's able to read the insights of your website. So it is very, very important. The nice thing you can do as well is there's a bunch of different platforms out there that will provide you with DMARC codes. And if you implement those DMARC codes, depending on the platform you're using, you can actually track spam rates, things like that within those platforms and they will alert you if you're getting blacklisted from a certain email list or some, or a certain spam list or something like that. So in, uh, yeah, it was December, 2023, Google began deleting accounts that have been inactive for more than two years. So Google's doing a big old cleanup of their own as well. Um, and so basically that's something that you've got to factor in. The other side of it is literally just, it's like, if you're an SEO, Google over the past several years has put their um, EAT, well, now it's EATT stuff in place where it's basically just, how do you want to rank better? Okay, it is putting out quality content. That's it, right? Like that's really what SEO is. It's very, very layman's terms. If you're big in SEO here, I apologize if that offended you. <laughs> but the email side, this isn't very different. It's very much like, Focus on your deliverability. Make sure you have a very clear unsubscribe button. Keep your spam complaint rate, um, I think it's what, 0 .0, 0 0.03 or 0.3. So you gotta keep that real low for every email you send out. You gotta keep bounce rates at a, at a reasonable level. So you've gotta think about cleaning your list and aiming just to make sure that you're at the top. So you've got like a 10 to 20% email open rate, that's not very good. You gotta get that to like 40s and 50s and like clean your list out and make sure it's in a good place. And then from the technical side to be able to track all this kind of stuff, your DMARC, your DKIM, getting that stuff loaded up and checking on all that. Um, uh, we had a question, is there a way to see how many emails we'll send a day within Klaviyo? Uh, there's not really a way to see how many Oh, how many you do send in a day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you can, um, within your reports, there's a, you can do a, basically like a filter option and you can literally just be like sent emails, opened emails, clicked emails, and then literally just change your date range to one day and you can look at it. Or if you look at it over a longer period of time, you can look at um, uh, like basically the trend of how many you're sending. Because if you send out a campaign, there's a really strong chance you're sending out more than 5,000 emails in a day. If you've also got automations going, you could be doing more than 5,000 a day all the time. What they didn't really make clear, it's for domains that are sending more than 5,000 emails a day. They don't say if like, if that's on a consistent basis. But on the other end of it, it's also, it's irrelevant because it's still a matter of, it's gonna happen to you eventually anyway. And they still are really just putting in stuff in place of they want you to follow best practices. So if there's anything that you do between now and let's say Thursday of next week, 
it's setting up the DMARC, DKIM, and SPF stuff. The SPF stuff you can get directly out of Klaviyo because it's essentially creating your own sending domain. So if you use Klaviyo and you just sign up and you're like, ah, I just want to use Klaviyo, um, you will, they'll give you a, oh, I forgot what it's, what it's called, but it's basically, it's like um, your name, uh, it's like uh, the domain and it's like from klaviomail.com or something like that, right? So basically you're actually using Klaviyo's sender domain. You want to set up your own so that it's, you know, maybe you're using something like info. So it's info at your and that's it. There's nothing else after that. So you want to get that, all that stuff set up. Um, Denise asked, where do you check if DMARC, DKIM, and SPF is being followed and maintained? That is definitely where I would suggest getting one of those platforms that can help you monitor that kind of stuff. Like we use Glock apps. It's something where you can make sure it's all set up. You're all technically savvy. I think it's like once a week we get a report on, you know, it'll give you a little green check marks on like, yes, it's still there. It's in a good spot. You're fine. It'll tell you if you've got blacklisted from a spam list or something like that. So there's ways that it will just kind of keep you updated. The other thing is to use uh, Google Postmaster. If Google's got a tool for it, I always suggest using it just to play nice with Google. Postmaster will do relatively similar things, not at the same rate, but I'm sure they'll probably make it better now that they're putting more strict rules in place. But it's all about like verifying your domains through DMARC, DKIM, and SPF, and then just following best practices, really. Um, we actually have a, we'll, we'll send out the slides. So there's actually a link here for the Klaviyo help document. So you can kind of see what Klaviyo put into place. Um, controlling your bounce, your spam rates. Look, they happen. It, it's no one's fault. Like you're going to get people who are added to your list. They were added maybe completely lawfully with no issues. Then 60 days go by and they never opened one of your emails. And then they decide to sit down one day and look at your emails and go, I don't even remember this company. And they unsubscribe or they spam you because some people just do that. It's going to happen and it's totally fine. As long as you're following best practices, you're allowed to have those. It just has to be at a low rate because there's a justifiable amount that you should be getting. So bounce emails, not always your fault. They happen. People's emails, they sometimes just don't, they delete their emails and so they're gone. So they're not real emails anymore. It's a hard bounce. So having in, you know, uh, you can look at exclusions. So segmenting your list of like, hey, let's ignore people that bounced. Let's go ahead and put those in a suppression list. Let's ignore people that maybe haven't engaged in a certain amount of time. Uh, we also, uh, we're also HubSpot partners. So like from our B2B commerce clients, there's a clear button they have that's like you ignore unengaged contacts because if they're unengaged and they haven't done anything with you in a really long time, you should probably ignore them for a, a good amount. You can set up different flows to try to engage them. But if you do it from an automated stamp, automated standpoint, I don't know why I said it like that. When you do it from an automated standpoint, you can try and engage them over time as opposed to doing one big blast, which might give you a really high bounce rate or a really high spam rate. So it's just about constant list cleaning. I got this. We're almost done. Sorry. I know we're a little bit over. I'm wrapping it up. I swear. Um, it takes time. Uh, you know, creating these uh, sender uh, segments, it's not going to happen overnight. Avoid sending to your entire list. You really don't have to do that. If you're doing a blast and you want to send it out to as many people as you can, consider ignoring people that maybe got an automated email recently or that just haven't been uh, engaged with you. Definitely abide by warming practices. You know, if you're starting off with a new sending domain or you're moving to a new platform, you want to make sure, like, don't send your whole list. Do, like, a chunk at a time and, like, ease into it. It's all about, like, you don't want a really big spam rate or a really big bounce rate because it makes it seem like your list is BS, so you want to actually pull that back. So, and, uh, Kate, to your point, yes, even if your list is small, it depends on how small your list is, but it doesn't hurt to do it in segments. If you're migrating over and you want to send slowly but surely, um, no matter how you want to do it, it's all about if your list is small now, I would imagine your goal is for your list not to be small forever. So if you keep it clean and you put the practices in place now, it'll stay clean and you'll be in a much better position as time goes on. Uh, so this is around the DKIM, DMARC, SPS stuff, just to give you a little, little bit of extra information on what they are. The DKIM thing's a really big thing. So it's your domain keys, identified mail. Your DMARC is domain-based message authentication reporting and conformance, and SPF is sender policy framework. Super big words. It is what it is. 
it's it's all about verifying your domain, making sure that it's legitimate, making sure that your sending domain is legitimate, and making sure that from a technical standpoint, you are tracking your spam rates, your bounce rates, all that kind of stuff. Uh, similar concept. O overall, it will reduce your spam. The nice thing about putting all this stuff in place is Google can see that. And so Google knows that you're taking care of it. So it's something in the mix. So again, for the SEO side, we talked about, oh, you want to have um, better quality uh, content and they just want to know that you're providing um, value. They also look at the technical aspect of your website. Is it fast enough? Is it, you know, doing this? Is it doing that? You have minified CSS, all that fun stuff. This is no different. They've literally just implemented a very similar concept to email is the technical aspect of your email in a good spot so that you can be notified if there's a problem so that you can address it and you can fix it. Otherwise, if they think no one's monitoring your emails, they're going to get rid of it. Uh, Easy DMARC is one that's out there. Glock apps is the one that I had mentioned to you guys. And then DMarkly is another one that's out there. There's a bunch of them. These are the ones that we usually suggest. Take a look at them. Easy DMARC has some free options. Glock apps, I think they have some free options, maybe, I don't know. Um, we've got a paid one. Uh, it integrates with Slack, so you can get notified right away if something's going on, which is fantastic. Um, DMarkly, I'm not familiar with, but I know that they're just a competitor. We use Glock apps for a while, so it's been a while since I looked at those. What we discussed, we discussed so much, and I've taken up enough of your time. I've gone a little bit over, so I'm going to not really bother you guys with this right now. Obviously, how we can help, we do this stuff all the time. As I mentioned, we are Klaviyo partners. We're also MailChimp partners as well as HubSpot partners. We use these platforms all day long, and we work with a ton of different D2C brands of all sizes with their retention marketing through uh, email marketing, SMS, et cetera. Always happy to chat with anyone. We've got a ton of case studies, which you guys saw as well. But the giveaway, within the next hour or so, you will be getting in your email the 19 Clavio automated email and SMS flows PDF that we've got set up. So you can review that, see everything that's in there. Uh, and then if you want to be submitted for the free email marketing audit, email me and just let me know that you want to be submitted for it. Okay. So my email is Andrew at Blue Tusker. Shoot me an email. I'm going to basically put it into one of those randomizers and we're going to pick someone to be able to win a free email marketing audit. And then outside of that, Thank you all for attending. I went a little bit over. We're good. We made it. Thank we you all. Uh, shoot me an email if you're interested in the audit or if you have any questions. I know we didn't have time for Q&A today, but I'm trying to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you all for joining us. And if you have questions, you know where to find us. Have a good one. Thank you.